Hello and welcome to the EAV Conversations podcast, where we explore a wide range of topics with inspiring and thoughtful guests. Thanks for joining us. Let's dive in. Meet Professor Giovanni Spitali, who is a researcher at the University of Zurich's Institute of Biomedical Ethics and History of Medicine. With a background in philosophy and a PhD in medical science, Giovanni works at the intersection of ethics, public health and technology. His research touches on everything from infodemics and crisis communication to AI, empirical ethics and improving healthcare systems. In this episode, we talk about how people can navigate a world shaped by algorithms and how academia needs to evolve. We first discuss the fact that some people feel like they're competing with AI, especially when it comes to writing. Let's listen to his point of view. Okay, to students who feel they are competing with AI, I think this is not a competition in that uh, humans uh, and especially generative AIs are doing very different things. One thing that uh, AI models will never be able to do is asking questions based on uh, our experience of reality. And this is something on which uh, we will win always, no matter what, because that's not what these tools are made for. Of course, if we compete for like the quality of our written text, uh, we lose. I myself, I am Italian. My, my first language is Italian, it's not English. So. I do use AI to prove my English because that's better than my English, but I do not feel disempowered or disenfranchised or less valuable because of that. That's a tool, right? The point is uh, being able to understand how it works so that we can use it. We also talked about the fact that today many young people experience the world through technology and asked him what advice he would give them to stay connected to the real human experiences while using tech as a tool. Actually, I am a massive user of technology myself. Uh, I wouldn't say it's like uh, mindless crawling on Instagram. I do that as well every now and then, but I watch lots of content on YouTube, for instance. So, So a lot of my perception of reality is not through reality itself, but it is mediated uh, via technological yes. device. And that's cool though, that we can do that because I can, uh, I don't know, watch these Deutsche Welle documentaries uh, uh, about how it is like to grow up in Russia, which for me is inaccessible. Um, what I do not use technology for is to access experiences that I can access first time. For instance, uh, I do a lot of paragliding. I am a paragliding pilot. Now I'm becoming also a tandem pilot. Uh, I do lots of kayaking, I used to climb a lot. For me, there is no point in watching videos or content about climbing, paragliding and kayaking, because this is stuff that I can go out and do by myself. So I use uh, new media and technological devices as a way to extend my experience of the world to reach parts of the world or of time as well that I would not be able to reach. Uh, I use technology, I do not use technology to reach parts of the world that I can experience by myself. That's kind of a, a good measure, I would say. Uh, one, one has to be aware of the fact that the technology is out there, it would be stupid not to use it. Because again, it's, it's a massive resource, it's a massive tool. Um, so I, I think having this uh, Manichaean approach, approach, black and white, uh, is wrong. It's stupid more than wrong. Uh, but this is a, a good measure, cutting, uh, cutting the line uh, on the things that you can do by yourself. Another crucial thing, uh, so being the one who's using the tool uh, and not uh, being uh, yet another cog uh, in a bigger machinery. This is a fact, uh, I mean, in this economy, what works in the platform economy, what, what is the actual good which is sold is my time. And uh, we know that, and we can be intentional and deliberate in doing that. So I am fine in selling this amount of my time. I am not fine in selling this other amount of my time and of my attention and my experience as a person. Yeah. So for instance, uh, it's a small and stupid thing, but at some point with my wife, we used to have an Instagram page about paragliding. And then we realized that we were creating content, uh, which was then used for free by the platforms. Uh, to uh, place advertisement and see, steal the fact to others people's time and attention and sell it. And I am not fine with that. 
And it, again, it is fine. It was not fine for me at the time to, to yes. be a content creator. In general, I, in general, that's not what I'm saying. It is fine to be a creator. But you need to know what you're doing and why, and you need to be fine with it. The last subject we talked about was academia and what changes he thinks are necessary to make academia research more agile and impactful. Well, uh, academia is old and slow mostly because of how we evaluate uh, output and careers. My output uh, and my career is evaluated based on the papers that I publish. And mostly uh, like the faculty, well, not, not my boss, my boss is a very decent person who has very clear um, priorities which are different from uh, like the standard uh, workings of academia. Uh, but basically, on average, for a researcher, what's important is to publish uh, on big journals uh, with a high impact factor. That's it. And journals are hard to publish in because uh, no one wants to do peer review anymore because peer review is free work that you are giving to, to the journals and the journals are not paying you. And on the other hand, actually, you pay a lot either to publish in open access or your readers pay a lot to get access to the articles. So we are paying all the time. We, as academia, we are paying all the time. And we are getting, the only thing that we are getting is the reputation that the journal said. We have to change this model because this is deeply dysfunctional. I am not saying that peer review is wrong. We need peer review, but we need proper peer review. And we need to disconnect peer review from journals. So we will need, uh, and I, I think this is something we need to do in the next five to 10 years, no more than that. Otherwise the, the system will collapse. We need to invent a new publication system, which then will lead to a new career evaluation system, which uh, ideally will break the monopolies of the big publishers, such as Elsevier, Springer Nature, yeah. these, these big groups here, which have profits uh, higher than those of Alphabet, so of Google. No, this is not true. They, they don't have higher profits, but the percentage of the revenue is higher. And, uh, and use these resources for what actually matters. So bringing some, doing better science and bringing science uh, outside the journals uh, into the world to have a, a real impact. Then we will be fast. Then we will be able to compete. That's one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is that uh, uh, innovation is happening as, at a pace which is faster than ever. Um, we have, for instance, when it comes to large language models, uh, development and deployment cycle, which is uh, in the area of six months to one year. And it can take six months to one year to uh, publish a paper, go through the like data collection, uh, writing, uh, uh, statistical analysis, peer review and publication. So it can be that uh, your study on this one large language model is already old uh, the day when it gets published. And this is also due to the different uh, uh, economic resources that we can access uh, when compared to, to these companies. And, and then one thing we should question is uh, whether we should start speaking about uh, taxes, such as an AI tax, uh, because uh, it's not that different from uh, the concept of a carbon tax, in that carbon emissions uh, are a source of benefit for those who are burning this carbon to produce energy, for instance. Uh, but then the negative externalities are for everyone. So in the same way, we decided to tax this negative externality, to tax the profits which are generating these negative externalities to mitigate these negative externalities. We should do something similar, or we could think about doing something similar with Gen AI. Gen AI is generating massive profits for companies, and uh, uh, this is leading also to massive negative externalities. Let's think about uh, deep fake revenge porn, for instance, uh, which is uh, sometimes used to target female politicians or journalists. Or let's think about uh, um, botnets, uh, which are faking support, uh, grassroots support for this or that uh, fringe political cause, fringe political movement. All of this is a negative externality. So we should tax these profits to compensate and mitigate and assess the negative externalities. And no one is even talking about that. I don't know why, because it is obvious, right? So we should at least open a discussion on this. Thank you for listening to the ERV Conversations podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, feel free to explore some other episodes or check out our social media platforms. Stay tuned. There's more to come.